Taking a look at episode two, am I back by popular demand? No, I'm just bored and I have nothing else to do since I've applied for as many jobs as I could find. Now just hoping to hear some responses. Anyways, let's continue and have a look into episode two. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the zombie universe equivalent of Bella from Twilight. But I don't hate Bella as much as I hate this woman. Why? Because Bella was a stupid teenager. Teenagers are naturally stupid. It's what they do. It's a process we all go through. She, however, is an adult. This is Lori. She's possibly the most contradictory, hypocritical, selfish, and egotistical woman I have ever seen in any TV show or movie that I cared about. And for some reason, she's in the center of this soon-to-be love triangle between Rick, Shane, and this THING! Where you been? I mean, the Mushroom Queen I had to wait for her to get back. Man, look at him go at it. It's been, what, three, two days since you thought Rick was dead and abandoned in the hospital? Can't have been more than at least a week. And she's already over her supposed dead husband. What a loving wife. <sighs> but before they do the deed, she notices the wedding ring that she has on her necklace, reminding her of the caring and loving husband that she was forced to leave behind, and tells Shane that she still needs time to grieve, like, or she'll just put it into the grass and forget about it so they can have dirty pig sex. And so we finish the scene with Lori being in doggy style, because as we all know, she's nothing but a total back to people we actually care about. We resume from where Rick left off in the last episode. He's getting help from our neighborhood pizza delivery boy, Glenn. Glenn contacts Rick via walkie-talkie and gives him the rundown of the situation outside of the tank. I'd say make a run for it. That's it? Make a run for it? My voice not as dumb as it sounds. You got eyes on the outside here. There's one geek still up in the tank, but the others have climbed down and joined the feeding frenzy where the horse went down. You with me so far? So far. Okay. Though this thought occurs to me. Why not try driving the tank first? GTA that thing and just run over whatever is in your way. Look for keys or however you start the tank. Okay, maybe actually without training you probably wouldn't know how to drive a tank. Do tanks use keys like a car? Rick decides to look one last time for last minute accessories before he leaves. Best Easter ever. Rick books it, meets Glenn, and Glenn takes him to safety. Nice moves there, Clint Eastwood. You the new sheriff? Come riding in to clean up the town? Was my intention. Yeah, whatever. Yeehaw. Glenn then tells Rick there are more survivors like him who are teaming up to make a low budget SWAT team. But the group isn't all that fond of Rick for some reason. Son of a bitch, we gotta kill you. Just chill out, Andrea. Back off. Come on. He's up. He's up. You're kidding me, right? We're dead because of this stupid asshole. I did. Turns out things had been okay for the group before Rick arrived. Every geek for miles around heard you popping off rounds. You just rang the dinner bell. Get the picture now. Meh, I've seen worse. Try working at Toys R Us during Black Friday. That is scary. But it seems like Rick is pale in comparison to the next person that ends up causing trouble for our team. Meet Merle, a racist for the series, ladies and gentlemen. This man is the prime example of the white trash all-American scumbags that you'll find around almost every trailer park possible. And I mean it, this guy's pretty much a big scumbag. But don't worry, there'll be other scumbags you'll come to hate. He's just the first, in my opinion. Other than Lori! You ought to be more polite to a man with a gun! Huh? Ugh. On a common sense, nigga. Merle throws some racial slurs, a fight breaks out, Rick gets clocked, and Merle tries to establish himself as the leader. However, Rick getting hit in the head like that turned his badass switch into the on position. That means I'm the boss, right? Yeah. Anybody else? Hmm. Anybody? Yeah. Go! Who the hell are you, man? Oh, 
officer friendly. Look here, Mo. Things are different now. There are no niggers anymore. No dumb as shit inbred white trash fools either. Only dark meat and white meat. There's us and the dead. We survive this by pulling together, not apart. Screw you, man. I can see you make a habit of missing the point. Yeah, we'll screw you twice. Ought to be polite to a man with a gun. Only common sense. Rick makes it clear here that nothing is getting in his way. All I am anymore is a man looking for his wife and son. Anybody gets in the way of that's gonna lose. I'll give you a moment to think about that. Got some on your nose there. Must resist urge to kill Redneck. After that, the group discusses on how they'll possibly get out with all these zombies walking about. At first, all may seem lost, but one of them worked at this department store and knows another way out. Old building like this built in the 20s, big structures often had drainage tunnels into the sewers in case of flood down in the subbasements. How do you know that? Because Activision wants to make a video game about this. So there has to be a sewer level at some point, kid. <sighs> There's always a sewer level. Oh man, I found a candy bar! Whoa, false alarm. Did that rat just squeal like a pig? Unfortunately for Rick and the group, it seems like the sewers is a no-go, so they need to come up with another plan. That plan? Covering themselves in zombie guts so they can smell like them. This is stupid. If I ever had a real complaint about the story of this series, this would be it. It's retarded. Other zombies movies have done this as well, and it was just as stupid. Fatalist can show you just how stupid this idea is in his review of House of the Dead 2. He's got a new plan, wiping zombie blood on himself so they think he's one of them. Again, I'd like to mention how this should probably just outright infect you, and they have no proof anything like this would work. But of course, all he has to do is believe it'll work, and it will, I guess. Seriously, this makes about as much sense as the walk like a zombie scene in Shaun of the Dead. So if you were going for comedy with a zombie sniffing at him... Good job! Surely one of the scriptwriters for the show mentioned that most people would puke their guts out after covering themselves in the rotten carcass of their fellow man. If zombies are able to differentiate each other by the smell, then how come zombies don't eat the freshly turned humans? If a person is bit and then goes zombie, I'm pretty sure they don't smell dead instantly. <sighs> but to be fair, Rick does explain why they are even willing to try such an idiotic idea in the first place. Desperate times call for desperate measures, I suppose. Bad ideas were an Olympic event. This would take the gold. He's right. Just stop, okay? Take some time to think this through. How much time? They already got through one set of doors. That glass won't hold forever. Cutting away from that stupid bit, we get to see a bit of Shane's character development as he interacts with Rick's kid, Carl. Shane shows he has more knowledge about tying knots than Lori will ever have on being a capable mother. Turns out T-Dog was able to finally get a signal with the walkie-talkie on the roof, and we find out that the group Rick found is a splinter group from this one. What should be done is quickly discussed and decided upon. We do not go after them. We do not risk the rest of the group. Y'all know that. So we're just gonna leave her there? Look at me, I know that this is not easy. She volunteered to go to help the rest of us. No, no. She knew the risks, right? See, she's trapped. She's gone. So we just have to deal with that. There's something we can do. So now covered in zombie B.O., the plan seems to work. Which is B.S. Thankfully, the god of plot convenience has a good cry over this. Or he's just laughing so hard at this that he's crying at the same time. I don't know. 
the latter seems the more likely. It smells washing off, isn't it? Is it washing off? No, it's off? not. Well, maybe. Okay, I'll admit, that was kind of funny. They make a mad dash over the fence and secure a truck. Not wanting to leave the others behind like jerks, Rick and Glenn come up with an idea to distract the zombies while the rest of the group pack up their belongings. You need to draw them away. Those roll up doors at the front of the store, that area, that's what I need cleared. Raise your friends. Tell them to get down there and be ready. I'm trying to get away. How? I missed that part. Noise. Oh, not again. Hey, I swear that wasn't me. Those roll up doors at the front of the store facing the street. Meet us there and be ready. Come on, let's go, let's go. Hey, you can't leave me here. We're falling, man. Morales. Hey, man, don't do that. Come on. On one hand, you know T-Dog wants to leave this piece of crap behind. On the other hand, how inhumane is it knowing that you condemned a man to be eaten alive by a bunch of cannibals? I enjoy here the inner conflict of choosing what's morally right and what's probably for the best. We all know Merle is scum, but does that truly justify leaving him cuffed up to the rooftop where if he doesn't die of thirst, he'll instead be ripped apart to shreds by zombies? Well, God chooses for T-Dog and makes it much easier on us. Being unable to do anything after that, T-Dog ditches him, but not before at least chaining up the door. Rick, meanwhile, gets back in time just before the others possibly get eaten, and they make their getaway. Of course, sooner or later, they notice someone's missing. Where's Glenn? Don't worry, he's fine. 